Welcome to the Futurist Freelance Podcast, brought to you by Zolo, the operating system for the solo economy. Every week, we're serving up an audio cocktail of expert tips, inspired insights, and stories from the frontiers of freelancing to help you grow your borderless business to new heights and live life on your own terms. So kick back, grab a snack, let's get started. Today we have a chat with serial entrepreneur and foundational digital nomad Andreas Vilgerdis, who shares his visionary ideas for the future of freelancing with us. For him, it's all about learning from our children, the way they collaborate and cooperate in such a natural and spontaneous way. And after an early career which started in the days of mobile communications beginning, Andreas is now truly realising the potential of the way technology has converged to create new communities of remote freelance free spirits, blending work and family and life itself in locations of their choosing. Oh, and we walk the talk on the blended work and family life approach in this call a little bit when we briefly collaborate with his three-year-old son, Magnus, who brings his delightful natural curiosity to the conversation in exactly the way we'd just been talking about. So enjoy and be sure to follow Andreas's work and adventures on LinkedIn. You'll find links in the show notes. So welcome, Andreas, to The Future is Freelance. It's great to have you here. I'd love it if you could start by sharing a little bit of your own journey in your career and your entrepreneurialism and tell me what you're doing today and how you got here. Thank you for the new dialogue. I enjoyed our dialogues in between. So I think first was last spring, if I recall it correctly. And... Mm. um, my journey probably started with my father, and then I joined my mother, and then a few months later I was born. So this is how my journey started this lifetime. And um, I'm the youngest of eight kids, and uh, was born into into a family which, uh, in which my father, as an example, started a yoga school in the 1970s, which was at that time pretty unusual. And um, yeah, experienced different aspects of life, and. Uh, was taken into ashrams in an early stage and enjoyed it. I I, I enjoyed the fact of meditation and uh, was exposed to this in a very early stage of my life and uh, rejected it afterwards in my own past and then uh, came back to it in a later phase. So, um, but I was lucky enough to be born in a place called Münster, which is a <clears throat> traditional German place. The untraditional aspect of this place is that it. Uh, hosted the mobile laboratory of Deutsche Telekom for digital communication. <clears throat> that was the unusual factor about that neighborhood. And so that factor is something which uh, became then something which impacted my life uh, after an apprenticeship, which I started after I moved out of formal schooling at the age of 15. Um, I was confronted with uh, the first uh, experiences of mobile communication and so how Mobile communication empowers people to operate from anywhere, anytime, and how enriching that actually is, and how much uh, it boosts the quality of life. And uh, yeah, the creativity of coming up with ways how that is uh, transforming humanity haven't, hasn't stopped yet. So, but uh, being born in that town and doing our first entrepreneurial endeavor, starting what became a mobile phone company at that time, um, brought me into a new spectrum yeah and digital mobile communication and the entire infrastructure mm-hmm. connected to it being it submarine cable fiber optics um, antenna solutions and satellites is something which i then learned about by exploring it and uh, becoming kind of a semi-expert on the subject and that brought me around the world uh, because that was an experience where by coincidence or germany was leading in that phase and europe was leading in that phase and so in my in my yeah. Early 20s, we were experts on the subject because we had two, three years experience uh, in an area which was highly relevant for the rest of the world. Did you imagine back then in the previous century when you were starting to work in GSM what we would have today with cloud-based communications and the kind of connectivity we take for granted? Um, certainly our, our children's generation take for granted anyway. I don't think I saw any of that. I felt that something is changing and shifting. I remember when I was confronted with, with market research studies telling me what the entire mm-hmm. projection is of mobile communication in Europe at the time, 
all of this felt wrong to me. But I, loved it. I wasn't able to argue why I would know more than the experts do who do all the market research and have these scientific methodologies to come to conclusions. They just felt utterly wrong to me. And um, I was blessed with the stubbornness and the intensity to follow my intuition. And I'm sure that drove some of the people I worked with crazy at times, but it uh, allowed me to stay that course. Yeah. And so as an example, I had some discussions with my first business partner, Rene Obermann, who became the chairman of Deutsche Telekom. So he followed the, the uh, corporate path. Um, we had discussions about why we should focus on digital mobile communication and not uh, move into other areas, which he believed are economically mm -hmm. and financially viable, interesting and all of this. But I felt somehow that it's not worthwhile our time and it's just diluting our, our brand and our reputation in the industry. <clears throat> and so luckily, uh, we had a situation where in a 50-50 in a partnership, if both don't agree, it doesn't happen. So we stuck to mobile communication with hindsight, probably the right choice. Um, yeah, so, but, uh, I didn't see any of that. I just felt there's something much bigger happening and, uh, this hasn't really changed yet. And, um, no. when I then was through our evolution as a company, uh, moved to places like Hong Kong, I saw what is happening over there and how that actually took it to a totally different level, how people were able to, to have phone calls and elevators and tunnels and everywhere, or how it made a major shake, uh, how those, early stage of digital mobile solutions empowered farmers to be aware of pricing, which otherwise they would have no idea about, or get weather warnings to make sure that their crop doesn't get destroyed and they know when to actually right. harvest. So this is actually transforming societies for the last 30 years. And so what we see now is just going to a different level. It is, uh, it is actually impacting how we live from A to Z, and it allows people to actually have a life-centric approach. So that uh, was in the last, what, 200 years, we created this model of going to offices. And um, that is, I believe, just very inhuman. So we, we didn't have conventional um, concrete office blocks before. So that mm. is all part of where we believe people have to show up at a certain time, have to be controlled, have to be micromanaged uh, to make certain things happen. And um, that is expiring. So it has been expiring over time. I remember yeah. when uh, we printed our first uh, business cards, which only included a mobile phone number that people really responded in unique ways to that 30 years ago. Um, this right. is um, now de facto the standard. And uh, sooner or later, my kiddos grow up by pressing a name or no, not a name, actually a photo. So they see yes. a person and touch that photo and then get connected. They don't ask themselves the question of any international area codes, country codes or connectivity features out of this dinosaur uh, history of telecommunication. So it's actually more personal than it ever was before. And you don't call places, you call people, and you call them by recognizing them or remembering them or mentioning yeah. their name. And that is the human way how we interact. Yeah, we don't have to remember a number. I don't know your passport number, but I can recognize you. Well, you don't have to even remember my phone number. Just click on a little profile picture. And I don't really want to remember your passport number, Maya, but uh, I'm happy to talk to you. So <laughs> that's... Um, and we'll be connected mm -hmm. wherever we are. It really is yep. a, a massive mm -hmm. transformation from those early days. And it's yep. it's really shaped the way we work today. Yep. Um, you mentioned the phrase life-centric. That's a really interesting way of flipping the work versus life model to put the the life, the person at the center of it. I noticed that in all your communications, you are the master of hashtags and the precise use of phrases, which are starting to shape the way we think mm -hmm. about life and work today. So tell me about that. Tell me about life centrism and e-humanism and how does that affect how we relate to each other? I think uh, that's the same when I, when I mentioned the thing e-mobile as empowered mobile solutions and not mobile phones or cell phones and this kind of stuff, because nobody cares about mm. that. It's like a laptop. Who cares? Yeah, and phones are not used as phones anymore. iPhones are barely used to make phone calls in the sense of uh, voice calls. So that is not a terminology yeah. which actually is helpful in the long run, and they will all expire, like hashtags will expire. But uh, waking people up and say, you know what, operate from a life-centric perspective, because when you're born and when you die, that is the most relevant thing. You breathe and you start breathing, and nobody got a manual for how to breathe. No baby got a manual for how to breathe, and we trust that they, we trust that they know. 
Yeah, we do not even count yeah. how often they breathe at night. We don't. So um, we just assume it all works well. And so uh, if we operate in life like this, then we, we uh, follow circularity. We actually apply a lot of things which nature teaches us by just looking at it. And we just forgot about it because mm. we believe that we know. And this is always the most dangerous position to be in. Uh, if we realize that we don't know, then we are actually back to be to be humble human beings who are temporary custodians of this planet and uh, embrace a great lifetime. And that makes things so much simpler. And we got seriously misguided by uh, creating a conventional education system, which now is waking up everywhere. Luckily, people realize mm. that education systems, the way how we have designed them so far, are totally irrelevant. And uh, at the day and age of uh, wider or mainstream AI solutions, um, not the kind of pocket calculators which you and I got at school, which were innovative at secondary school and which you were allowed to use, but not for exams. You still had to do it with paper and a pencil. So, and Because yes. uh, you won't always have a calculator in your pocket, the teacher said. I know. <laughs> no, and, and don't collaborate even though that's what the rest of your life looks like um yeah i never understood why i shouldn't collaborate for exams because there were people sitting next to me who knew yeah, much more than had I different did. skills and so why would i not ask them so, very very illogical thing for me but this is why i clashed with formal schooling and uh, had to resign from that but um we are back in a phase where people are, are ready to approach uh, life in a humble, life-centric manner. And if you apply the word life-centric, then everything mm. looks differently. Then you do not go on a vacation to escape from a life you shouldn't live in the first yes. place. Yeah, so you see a lot of the transformation people have moved in the last three years into places which are normally used as vacation places. Because Why not? weather is nice, yeah. you don't need a heating bill. Yeah. And infrastructure is there, and whenever you are getting out of phone call, you can spend half an hour in the sun and you feel recharged. And so these are all things which are so simple, but we have not embraced them for the last 200 years. Luckily... Yeah, and now we have the technology, we can do it. We had the technology for quite a while, but now people have seen it. So there's a tipping point where through the pandemic, people mm -hmm. who normally work for insurance companies or banks were allowed to work remotely. And some of them, instead of being stuck in their flat in Cologne or in Paris, actually moved to Sicily for three months or six months. And they realized, oops, yeah. that's actually nice. And lunch is this half is the good. price mm. and uh, life is good. And so that is the wake-up yeah. call, which could have, have, could have happened, I think, 20 years earlier. Um, but uh, it happened now. And thanks to Mother Earth sending us um, a pandemic experience, people were not uh, people followed the orders and those orders led them into models which they would have not otherwise ever pursued including brilliant including so. education models where people actually realize either that they should have never been parents because they don't really like to spend time mm -hmm. with their children or they really love to be parents because they realize wow it's actually cool to be around them yeah so this is the yeah. situation where how did, uh, I think, Jack Ma and, and Alan Musk uh, said it two years ago, the world's biggest macro problem is the shrinking population. So people, the majority of people realize that they don't want to have children because it's challenging and demanding. And uh, yeah. I'm sure the majority of the people who have children today don't want to have them if they cannot drop them off uh, for the whole day at uh, preschool, school, after school uh, curriculum activities, extracurriculum activities, whatever. So if they really would have to face them and spend time with them, quality time, majority would not have them. But this is why... Yeah, well, lots of people found it hard in the pandemic when they suddenly had to have their families around 24-7 in cultures and communities really not designed for that. And certainly their professions were not designed to accommodate. The design is probably the answer. So if we go back uh, how life was before when kiddos were part of a neighborhood and it took a village to raise a child, mm. if we use that terminology to, to draw a picture, yeah. then you see in communities where kiddos can walk to friends, places, neighbors, uncles, extended family, everything is fine. Because they just walk there and they yeah. come back when the sun goes down. Everything is fine. But we created artificially these odd environments in which you drive your kids around all day and um, they are in multiple different assignments in parts of town, which is all counterproductive. It doesn't help the kids. It doesn't help the traffic. It doesn't help the pollution. It doesn't help any of those.
Yeah, it doesn't help the kids to feel yeah. confident about their own logistics and uh, about the fact that they actually are capable to take many parts of their life into their own hands. Yeah, the model which we allowed to unfold in the last 30, 50, 100 years did the opposite. Now we are back at a yeah. point where people so are actually conscious parents are living models where they don't have to be in offices all day and they don't have to work uh, five, six days per week, uh, but they actually can do things remotely and they can do things where the kids are around, can ask questions and even have uh, quality dialogues. Brilliant. Can you share some examples? Because I know you've been working with projects who are building just this, these kind of work, life, intergenerational communities. So where is this happening and what does it look like? If you go into the clusters of remote workers, you find them. So if you Google, if you hashtag world schooling, you find them. These are all people who are consciously mm. having children and they create models around it where, as an example, they sign up tutors for three to six months and then bring together groups mm. of children of multiple ages, so following the Montessori model, and actually allow them to learn. And they do this for two, three, six months at a time. And uh, it is not anymore following uh, which is what they call in different countries the educational model of a local state. So we always had this, this Kulturminister or Kultusminister mm. in, in certain states in Germany. They, they told you what you have to learn in that year. And if, if these people would have any foresight yeah. about actually what is relevant for a new generation to, to lead the planet into a next phase, and most of them don't because they come from a dinosaur world themselves. And um, they're normally uh, the least competent to, to look at things on a more global scale. And this is why we don't teach in these old school models many things which are highly relevant for life, being it about your own health, being it mm. about your financial health, your physical health, yeah. your mental health. Those things are excluded. Uh, this is why we have a pandemic of teenagers who associate with mental health problems. And so this is happen, happening right now to a degree which never happened before. And to go back to your question, you see in the remote clusters in areas like Portugal, in areas like Mexico, in areas like uh, Spain, in areas like Italy, in areas like Turkey, in Bulgaria, wherever there are clusters of people who work remotely, yeah. follow the fiber optic lines because you need internet connectivity follow the geo arbitrage perspective so where actually can you get a lunch for half the price of uh, berlin or 20 percent of the price of london um this is where you find those families who are working remotely and to uh, allow their kids to to follow a world schooling model which uh, allows them to embrace know-how and how on a global scale and so that's a generation which will address issues which we consider as complex with ease mm. Yeah, because for them, borders are existing, but are not limiting their brain capacity. Yeah, and they're learning the skills that will help them thrive in an uncertain future, the critical thinking, the ability to make decisions, evaluate information. Um, and those are the things that are going to help them in the, the future of work. Now, we at the moment, we're living in this transitional phase, maybe where a lot of people are mm -hmm. still operating in that jobs paradigm of the nine mm -hmm. to five. Um, this podcast is called The Future is Freelance. And that's obviously something that we believe in that this model of, of jobs and working full time for some other enterprise is probably something that's becoming a little outdated. How do you see that future unfolding? Will people still want jobs? Or will we come to something that's a lot more flexible over time? Uh, look at the playground. So when you see kids playing, uh, you see them coming up with ideas and uh, the first come up, some people say, mm, second one, mm, and then somebody comes up and then, yeah, we do it. Okay. So if the context is great, people love to pursue missions and actually will not stop until it works successfully. If you create that model around an employment model or around a freelance model, that is secondary. Right. Yeah, so that is secondary. The only difference if you use the... Uh, existing old school terminologies like employed, not employed, free, freelance, not freelance, et cetera, et cetera. Those systems were designed around keeping people stuck and people not moving and giving people in some kind of protection, believing that people are not competent to pursue their own rights. Mm -hmm. So they are all designed around the old school system of not empowering people. So freelance uh, includes the word free, 
and lands, not too sure, but uh, empowered people is maybe another terminology for it. Empowered people can choose. They can be employed for two years, that's fine, but they are not going to believe that the pension model will cover their life livelihood in 30 years. Right. It will not. Yeah. So if it, if it takes to be employed for two years or three years or whatever it is, and, f and you use those models in certain jurisdictions, that's fine. So those models have their upsides yep. and they have their downsides. Important is to know about it and see the alternative. So as an example, then you can see you can be in a place like in Bulgaria and you still, even if you're employed, you have a tax rate of 10%. Yeah? If you go to certain countries, if you're employed, you figure out that you get half of the money which you agreed on because these are all kind of interesting reductions, deductions, whatever issues because people in the country believe that you should support many, many things out of whom you probably do not subscribe to 80%. Mm -hmm. So uh, people are always willing to share. You know, people are always willing to share know-how and do-how and some resources. You can see this in any crisis moment. Yes. Yeah. So when there's a crisis moment, a lot of people have to support each other. Yeah. If you see young kiddos and you give them a set of pencils or colors, they are happy to share their blue and the yellow because they cannot draw at the same time with the blue and the yellow. Yeah. So, and as they know, if I need the yellow, I can ask the guy who has a yellow now to use a yellow and he gets my blue. So the idea of you have your own set of this and you have to maintain it, you're in charge of it, is uh, creating a very complex society, which we have now for long enough. People are happy to share and people are happy to care. So this is how humans are designed. Yeah. So if we allow that to happen, then people are now looking at it from a broader scale. So the old terminology of freelance or employed is, is secondary. What is important is that the mission is great and people love to support the mission because they believe in it and they want to be part of it. Yeah, that sounds yeah? great. So that is the core and the playgrounds are a great example. You can watch it all the time. That's, you can see if there's a great context, too. everybody goes for it. They will climb all on the same tree. If yeah. that is exciting and it makes sense to them and it feels right. They will collaborate. So, and exactly. synergize and what they're all bringing to bingo. the party and it will be bigger and better as a result i think you're right we, we should listen to the some, kids yeah. they they have not been destroyed yet so they intuitively follow it yeah yeah so we have seen that with the manabu project which is a project i got involved in a few years ago and this is when my oldest daughter i think came up and said you know she wants to change something about a neighborhood she was in at that time in zagreb croatia and so then she met somebody who had these Manabu characters. Um, and so nevertheless, that triggered uh, an experience where in the beginning, maybe there were 10, 15 kids. It became a nationwide project, which was replicated at many schools and many other neighborhoods. And it's, yeah, logically it became an issue on, was on national TV, then it became across neighborhoods in other countries which are around the neighborhood. So these are all things, but if the context is right and you mm. empower the kids, they're unstoppable. Brilliant. So we have to empower the adults somehow as well. Um, yeah, you know what? Sadly enough, I don't. I don't believe in that. I believe that the eighty percent of the people I know, yeah, or who I come across, who are older than twenty, twenty-five, they're actually mentally dead. They live a life where they already have their payment plans and the options, and everybody sorted out everything sorted out, and they know that they have to pay off whatever they got involved in, and they're not really willing anymore to embrace change. That is what we have, and that is okay too. That is okay too. You only need three to five percent of the world population to to move the planet to the next phase. So, and I rather focus on the kids who are still open to actually embrace themselves, love themselves, and then share that love and that glowing and growing. It's not only about yeah. growing; it's about the glowing part. The glowing part creates leadership, and the glowing part creates following. And if the glowing part doesn't work anymore, um, this is what I described before, that 80% don't have that glowing anymore. Their dimmer is on 25% capacity. And if you try to move it, they will fight a toe and nail to actually don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't get involved. Oh, we have to try though, don't we? I mean, you and I aren't kids, Andreas. We're, you know, surely there has to be a way that we can help empower these humans instead of writing them off to the concrete boxes in the pension plan. I'm, I'm not I'm not writing them off. What I'm saying is that there are some who reach mm. out and who follow. And that's great. They get inspired. That's fantastic. And that is fantastic. But your day, my day, only have 24 hours. And i rather have the luxury and the pleasure of, of dealing with the people who come and who get inspired than trying to convince people who fight a toe and nail and believe they're in the current model. And you cannot, yes. it's, it's not really worthwhile. 
So as an example, when we put the mobile phone number on the business cards, we didn't say everybody has to do it. No, we didn't. We didn't. This is not everybody has to do it. And that's okay too. They can still have their landlines and their office phone and whatever phones they want to have stuck everywhere. You know what? It's okay. If they want to get entangled in wires, <laughs> let them get entangled in their own yeah. wires. That's cool. It's their choice and that's okay too. Yeah. So um, there are so many kids around the planet already who are open and willing to, to and who are fascinated by glowing and growing. And that is unstoppable. So movements which are around children go viral. And yes, they reach a whole bunch of adults because the kids have better access to That's those true. adults yeah. than you and I do. Yeah. The challenge which you and I always have is that say, oh, why does she know more than I do? So oh, what does this whatever tall German guy tell us what we don't know? Mm -hmm. So and this is creates kind of a resentment automatically included because we are grown ups. So if they hear if they listen to kiddos, they're by far more flexible to listen to it. So this is why I believe it's it's crucial to activate the kids because they have a, a wider reach when it comes to adults compared to you and me. Yeah. If my daughter goes on TV, people love to listen to her. Yeah. If if I go on TV, a whole bunch of people will say, "Who is that guy? Why would we listen to him?" So, uh, and she just has a charming factor of now being nine years old. Or my my uh, youngest yeah. son right now is three years well. old. People love to hang out with him and listen to him. And so, you know what? I rather bank on on reaching a few thousand more of the kiddos because they have more of an impact on grown-ups than you and I will ever have. Yep, that's true. So their future is going to look very different then. I remember when you and I first spoke a year or so ago, I was interviewing mm -hmm. you about remote work and you pointed out to yep. me that that term is going to become redundant. We're not going to talk about remote sure. work or office work. We're just going to talk about work and we might not even talk about work. We'll just talk about life and how we spend our time. How do you think yes. that's going to apply to business and structures like e-residency, freelancing, contracting? What's it, what are our kids going to talk about in the future when, when they talk about work? How will that look for them? Will it all blend into, into life? Yes. That's where it starts and that's where it ends. Okay. So we're... And the, the, core, the core thing is a glowing part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you see this with, with even successful companies being, being at Apple. When the glowing didn't work, there was a time with Apple, they were close to bankruptcy. Yep. When the glowing was, was came back, <laughs> you remember the, the IMAX, which looked like, like a candy? So the glowing came back and things changed. Yeah. So, and if there's a glowing part, things work. Yeah. So it, it's not about growing only. Growing in pain and growing in suffering is not very attractive. Yeah. And so. Mm. It still seems to be part of that startup culture that we have to hustle and have pain and sleepless nights and we have to hire people and own them 100 percent of their time and is that all going to change do you think it is it's already changed it is, it is not attracting anybody it is not if, if a lobster grows and and has to i think blow his shell he goes under a rock for a while and waits for the transformation and a new shell to grow this is what nature shows you uh you just have to allow yourself to sometimes be under the rock and that's fine too mm -hmm. yeah and so um that is a process, but the whole pain curve scenario for itself to say you have to work hard and never believed in working hard. Yeah. So, um, I always believed in enjoying what you're doing and that can be really fascinating and can take all the energy out of you, but then you don't, it doesn't feel hard. So, yeah. so even in the most exhausting projects I was involved in in my life, it didn't feel hard. It was just highly compelling and I wouldn't stop because I felt it's utterly important for it to succeed. But the word hard wouldn't cross my mind. Yeah, so yes. um, that is where there's a lot of old school terminology around, and that's okay. But you, you see that that is not around on the playground. Right. When you see everybody being fascinated by following that idea and being on that project, following that leader, uh, they do it because they love to do it. And they would never use the word hard. Yeah, it makes its own energy. No, no. They they wouldn't use the word hard. The word hard is all invented by us in the last 200 years and a lot of things which are related to the industrial age education models and the control feature. And if there's one thing you cannot do in this universe is control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, control is just an odd thing which we believe we have. And then again, none of us knows how often we breathe at night. So we have so little control on the things which really matter. Um yeah, you have to trust that your system works and your body digests and all of it, in which we barely mm -hmm. understand how it works. We're just fascinated that yeah. it works. Yeah, and so um, 
that's a beauty about life and that's a beauty about uh, being a humble human being and accepting the fact that we don't know that's exciting yeah so what are you working on now because i think you're in greece at the moment or have you moved again uh it's just just our the base which we established here in Bansko to to really embrace what was created here and take it to the next level it's just uh 90 miles from the ocean yeah and just uh, 30 miles from the greece border okay so the the area here which is uh, the old neighborhood of alexander the great is very close to what we nowadays call greece and what we call uh, mm -hmm. turkey and so it's just an environment which is blessed with nature and uh, an amazing uh, in richness of species fantastic climate and and uh, beautiful neighborhood and great connectivity so the, the closeness to istanbul being one of the or i think right now the most connected airport on the planet yeah. and and everything which that neighborhood has to offer is just fascinating and um the beauty of that area is that not everybody left for germany or for france or for the uk so everything which is not part of the eu like turkey actually is rich of young people and uh, diversity and a prospering uh, place in many many ways um yeah and so that is part of this neighborhood and so we enjoy that but uh, we still call malta our our home base and yeah malta has just uh, a small tiny fraction of all of this because it has been populated since what twelve thousand before christ this is one of the numbers there in circulation but it always has been part of the hot spot mm. of uh, People are coming together and being part of transformation, um, being located in the center of the Mediterranean and uh, having been on many of those crossroads. And that leaves logically an impact on, on yeah. the operating system over there. Brilliant. So what sort of community is coming together in Bangso? Is it sort of digital nomads, remote workers, families? Who's around? All of that. All of that. So what we have seen now since we got involved with Bansko last summer and that attracted a few people to come and create videos and footage mm -hmm. and all of it that the numbers of international families spending time here or establishing a part of their life here seem to have doubled so i was told by some people who are, have been here for a few years that the number of international families doubled so and they spent here two months maybe six months maybe three months maybe establish a base because real estate is very affordable you can rent a place here for less than what you pay in condominium fees, let's say in Miami, so or in in London or in Berlin or anywhere else. So the cost, the geo arbitrage mm. factor of Bansko is still high. So uh, fifty thousand euros allows you to buy a great flat, um, and uh, the cost of living factor uh, is very powerful too. So yes, there are international families who come here and to enjoy the fact that it's a great environment where kids can walk everywhere, where world schooling models occur and happen, and where you have a significant number of co-working spaces. I think it's the world capital when you look at the number of co-working spaces on a pro rata basis. So there's no place in the world which mm. has more. And it's the same if you check the world schooling group, Bansko. I don't think there's any other place which has more world schooling group members in their Facebook group. Again, on a pro rata basis, uh, considering the size wow, okay. of Bansko, so that's why you've put yourself at the heart of all of this, um, where it's actually happening. That's very exciting. So uh, Bansko has those features. And uh, yes, it is a combination of all of those. Families are more and more coming, young families, especially with young kids. And so that is a, that's a big upside. And then, yes, formerly digital normats, young people, uh, people in their early 20s, is, it has been already a significant crowd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's just uh, something which gains momentum. But I'm sure there will be more places. But Bansko has a blueprint of having been moved from nowhere mm. to this kind of a uh, thought leader location in the process of five years. And you see what, what Gonzalo did last year in Madeira. So he just kicked it off last spring. And this is now establishing itself. He's doing the same with Cape Verde, so which is a fantastic location for especially right. people who love to have a winter climate euro time zone location with geo arbitrage which still works for a lot of people who actually have business relations in north america yeah. so and there will be more and more locations in what i call this greater mediterranean mm. and just yeah bansko is just a prototype in which you can see a lot of things how they unfolded and what you learn from it and how you can do it uh, apply the same learning curve or do it even in a in a more focused manner so but uh, 
Yeah, there are other locations who have the same features or even better, which I can see. Yeah, it's interesting physically, just this idea of being in the central Mediterranean, that you're in the middle of the world and you can collaborate with people in the Americas, with Asia. Um, you're kind of, you can overlap with everywhere and connect with everywhere. And that feeds into the geo arbitrage as well and the cultural interactions that you experience there. What you need first is the, is the fiber optic connection. You see this in Madeira. Yeah. Madeira only happened because the Ella cable was connected from Brazil to Portugal. And this Ella submarine right. cable connected not only Cape Verde, it connected the Azores, it connected um, Madeira, etc., etc. So that was the essential thing that happened a year before. So Gonzalo would have not been able to do this three years earlier. Um, so you need mm -hmm. that fiber optic infrastructure in place. And so if you look at the world's map, and or if you compare this to a human body, you need the arteries, you need the blood circulation system. And so telecommunications yes. allows that. And so if you follow where the fiber optics are, combine that with great climate zones, and then ideally look at if this is a place which has physical connection to, and hopefully even something like the legal and fiscal framework, which is a taxation model and a visa model which works, then you can see why those places have been or are very successful. Look at Georgia, a place where you do not need a visa, but just on arrival, you get normally a 12 months uh, access. So... There are locations like that, which then led to a place which is uh, prospering and attracting people from all over the world. Yeah, so Schengen places are actually at a disadvantage in that context because logically accessibility for the majority of the people of the planet is difficult. Yeah, so if you're not yeah. born with the right passport, you will have no fun getting Schengen visas. Yeah, but places like That's Bulgaria true. luckily are not part of Schengen. Places like Turkey are not part of Schengen. Places like Morocco are not part of Schengen. So you mm -hmm. have ample of those who can actually use the upside of having fiber optic connections, having the right climate, and having geo arbitrage factors. And that's all, that is all it takes. Yeah. And you can still combine that with a business in the EU, thanks to the Estonian e residency. Um, you can have your business presence within that yeah. trading block, but you can be physically located anywhere. You can do this with Estonia. You can do this with setting up a company in America. You can do this in many ways if you if you just learn the basics of what is a way to operate legitimately within the existing legal and fiscal frameworks. That's an important thing. Mm -hmm. So, sadly enough, a whole bunch of people who are yeah. traveling with their backpack and their headset, they do not even want to look into it. Yeah. So, and at school sure. or when they did their master's program, nobody taught them anything about legal and fiscal frameworks or what to check in different mm -hmm. jurisdictions. This is kind of Chinese for them. Uh, yeah. And so, when I when I was still operating companies and employing a few hundred people, I realized people with their masters and PhDs had certain basic knowledge missing, uh, which just makes them highly non street smart. And so, what we see yeah. now with some of the remote workers, they really realize how important it is to train yourself in some basics when it comes to legal and fiscal um, rules. If you understand yeah, that, that self reliance. Yeah, you know, self reliance um, should be a basic 101 in the first place. You know how to use a bathroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, this is the part of your daily processing is that you understand yeah. uh, those uh, basics and then see how they best support the project you want to be part of. Yeah, it's true, and it still it stems as you as you said before from the education system that's preparing yes. us for that cubicle lifestyle, um, where you take your MBA and go and work for some big firm, and you never have to think about stuff like that because it's all just managed for you, and you're given this set of circumstances and locations and activities, and yeah, you can have a certain kind of life, but they'll never enjoy what you're enjoying now. I mean, I first came across your work through the stuff that you share. Mm -hmm. And you're an amazing content creator and advocate for this kind of lifestyle design and life-centric living. We will put all those links into the show notes for this episode. But if, in case anybody's just listening now and wants to jump on your stuff, where's the best place to connect with you? Where do you put your best videos and content out for people to enjoy? I wouldn't be able to judge what is best. Um, the things which I have been learned to, which I taught myself how to how to apply, and uh, which actually serve the sharing of content well. Logically, LinkedIn became highly relevant now, and so that works exceptionally well. And yeah. uh, everything from there is probably then then just a natural extension. So certain things work faster uh, through things like Instagram at this stage. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure we will we will find out a whole bunch of new things within the within the next years to unfold. 
Yeah. yeah Ideally, all of this. You see? Hello, Magnus. <laughs> Afterwards, can I speak with Maya here first? I have another Maya on a video call. That's confusing. That's beautiful. They're different Mayas. You want to say hi? This is another Maya. Let me see. Let me see. Come in. Come. I see it. <laughs> Hello. Hey, good to meet you, Magnus. You want to say hi? How are you doing? How are you? Good. Good. You good. cut your finger? Is this better now? Oh. Good. You all right? Good. Yes. Mom is going to be better. Great. Okay. Can you close the door, Sunshine? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, um... LinkedIn is a is a easier platform to get that uh, access to it, and then from there, I think the rest uh, is easy to find. So I normally interconnect those and and uh, put certain links in those postings, which lead to the other ones. So I try to make it yeah. uh, a simple experience, and this allowed me to reach people. Brilliant. Well, I will say to people then: start with connecting on LinkedIn. Yeah. There you can find connections to all the other amazing projects that Andreas and his family are involved in. You can see more of that gorgeous little boy and what he's up to in his education and his growth within communities that are fostering that. So this has been a fascinating conversation. It's left me optimistic about the future for our kids, for our economy, for our planet overall. And um, Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Anytime, anytime, reach out. And I believe we have never been in a better position as we are today. And that includes all the unrest which is currently happening. But the fact that people can share it in real time and you can actually mm -hmm. mobilize people on the planet in no time, this is very, very empowering. And we see this with current conflicts being uh, occurring on the planet. But uh, to, to make that widely understood uh, is something which has never been as powerful as, as it is right now you can you can see this how quickly things are shared and how it actually reaches people motivates people and and carries uh, courses forward and you can be on the opposite side of of tables and arguing about it but nevertheless you have access mm -hmm. to both perspectives which uh, is something which we never had before okay yeah i will fix it in a minute let me just finish my dialogue with maya okay i'm gonna let you go now so thank you can you. deal with that little boy but I will. thank you very much Anytime. Um, We'll nice keep talking. You. Good. You've been listening to the Futurist Freelance Podcast, brought to you by Solo.io, who offer compliance, taxation, invoicing, and admin solutions for fiercely independent solopreneurs across the globe. From simply getting paid to launching a full EU-based limited company, Solo has you covered. Thanks to Estonian e-residency and a superb suite of streamlined business software. If you enjoyed the show, please like, rate and comment and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you.